Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have to wait on that. We've got to get going. We've got literally about three weeks worth of stuff to do in the next hour and now five minutes. Okay. So we're gonna have to we're gonna have to move on. Okay. Okay. So hi. hi. I'm Isolde Trachtenberg, and I will be your Pat Sajak for today. <laughs> and up there is Todd Brown, and he's going to be your Vanna White. He's the Vanna White for the day, and I am the Pat Sajak. We're going to be talking to you about the GLOW program. By the time you are done with this this afternoon, it's the fastest training in the West. You will be fully certified GLOBE teachers in what we have taught you. So we're going, to, we're going to get ourselves all nice and situated, and we're going to get ourselves together, and we're going to do some soil characterization training. You're going to get it done. You're going to do the field work, and you're going to be set to go. Okay? The thing is, you're not going to get to do the field work outside because it is raining, and they're calling for thunderstorms. So we will be doing our field work indoors kind of modifying it a little bit so that you still get a lot of the essence of the field work you'd need to do, but you would do it indoors. We're going to be moving kind of fast because we're starting uh, about 10 minutes late. So GLOBE. Global Learning and Observations to Benefit the Environment is what the acronym stands for. It was envisioned by Al Gore in his book Earth in the Balance. He envisioned a partnership among students, scientists, and teachers that would be international in scope. He wanted students to get psyched about the earth, and he wanted students to do earth science. So what he did is he said, okay, let's make this happen. Let's have students, scientists, and teachers work together. We'll have scientists who are responsible for coming up with the protocols that will give us the science we're gonna be doing and make sure that they're rigorously tested to make sure they're vetted, to make sure the protocols are repeatable and will give us good data. And then have that data available for the world community to use to do research on the Earth system. So that's something he can actually say he did invent, which is kind of cool. Here, is the vision. Take a look at that for a second. To me, what's cool about it is that it is local, regional, and global. Locally, the students will learn about their local school environment. Globally, they'll be able to share that data to everyone else in the world who's part of the program, and also everyone else in the world, period. Anybody who wants to can look at the data analyze the data, use the data to do research. So it can be students, it can be scientists, it can be teachers, it can be private citizens. It doesn't matter who you are. Anyone in the world has access to the data. It's a public data set. Because it's global, the students themselves can actually do partnership work together. They can collaborate. So for example, right now I have a school in Maryland who's doing a cloud study with a school in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic. And they're actually comparing latitudinally, they're comparing the difference in the quality and cloud cover and cloud type of their clouds. Speaking of clouds, you all on your desk in front of you should have, this is a postcard about primary globe. You might not be that interested in it. It's about elementary globe. You all have a DVD of a teacher's guide, and you all have a cloud chart. Those are yours to keep. The mission to promote the teaching and learning of science Enhance environmental literacy and stewardship and promote scientific discovery. It's like what they were talking about the keynote address on Monday. Basically, get, get kids psyched about science, get them interested in learning more, get them curious, and get them going into STEM careers. GLOBE does that really, really well. This is the set of GLOBE countries. Okay, it started out with the US. Coincidentally, the country of my birth, Moldova, was the first GLOBE partner country. They were the first country that signed a reciprocal agreement with the US to be a GLOBE country. Now we have 111 countries. There are two key countries that are missing, okay? First being China. China is not a GLOBE country. Most populous country on the planet is not a GLOBE country. Makes me a little crazy. The next one is Brazil. That one is missing also. We'll talk more about why that makes me twitch in a little while. Primary GLOBE is essentially, if you teach special needs kids, this will work, but since you're all high school teachers, what this is is it's primary readers in the various aspects of the GLOBE program, you can get them. That little postcard that you have is also some more information about Primary GLOBE. The cloud chart. Talking more about the cloud chart. This cloud chart is in the UN languages and it details the 10 main types of clouds. The US Weather Service categorizes over 200 types of clouds. We've got 10. Okay, and, and this one's translated into the UN languages, which is cool. Now you're getting this for free. I highly recommend you laminate it right away because it'll get messy. The thing is, any more and it'll cost you. So what I've done, if you go to soillady.com and 
it's right here, written kind of dark, but there it is, soilady.com, and click resources. You can download a globe char cloud chart that is all in English, but it's essentially all the same words with a couple of different images, but it's yours to use for your heart's content, however long, however much. Please laminate them, they'll last a lot longer. Thank you. Sure. Whoever's phone is going beep, can you turn it off? Whoever's phone is going. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it's because because it'll 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 derail me like crazy. Um, I'm really hyped up on caffeine right now, so it'll derail me. I'll start listening to it instead of doing what I'm supposed to do. <laughs> Looking at the student data, what's interesting about this is because they decided to make the data collection rigorous, because they decided to make it a set of protocols wherein everybody in the world, anybody who does a protocol, is doing it the same way. The data are valid. The data are anything that you are trained to do as a teacher, and this is something for you all to know. Once you are done with this training, you will be fully um, certified to teach what we've taught you. You can then enter the data into the data server. Now, can you teach other aspects of GLOBE? Absolutely. But you can't enter them into the data server until you've been trained on how to do them. Make sense? It's because they want the data to be nice and valid. But having said that, though, I should go back. Looking at the data, as I said, anybody in the world can look at the visualizations. Over time, we've got atmospheric data, we've got hydrologic data, we've got soils data, land cover data. The database, it's not always complete, but it started in 1995, and it's been going. So there are certain data sets that we have on the GLOBE server that are actually nice and continuous, and the students can do some really nice analysis. The Earth System Science Activities. One of the things that GLOBE really wants is they want to have Earth systems as the approach we take to study the Earth. Who can tell me about what the Earth system is? What does it mean? What does Earth systems mean? Water circulation. It's all about the cycles, right? Hydrologic cycles, carbon cycle, nitrogen cycle, all the cycles. So what they did they're looking at it from a systems approach. You don't look at just one thing. You don't look at just clouds. You look at clouds and how they contribute to rainfall and how rainfall contributes to soil moisture and how soil moisture con contributes to the land cover and on through the whole system. To that end, what they did is they, they created this poster. I'm not going to open it all the way, but it's got tons of really beautiful satellite imagery. And there's a wonderful little activities guide that accompanies the poster. Now, they only sent me one per session. But what we've been doing is anybody who gives me a cool soil science fact or an exclamation that makes soil sound awesome will win. So you will win the poster if I hear it from you, OK? That's how it works. Before the end of the afternoon, somebody will walk away with that poster. Globe across the curriculum. The thing is, globe itself is not a curriculum. It's not what it is. It'll fit into your curriculum. And in fact, the soils portion, for example, you can go to soillady.com and we have a listing of, you could go for Pennsylvania, there's a listing for how does it fit the standards for what you're supposed to be teaching. And I think they're working on Common Core on the actual website, so there's a lot of stuff that you can look at and see what it's going to satisfy as you teach it. You'll be learning the basic stuff today, the basic uh, field characterization protocols, but you can expand upon it and do an incredible amount of science, chemistry, physics, bio. In fact, how many bio teachers do we have? Okay, how many chemistry, physics, earth science, environmental science? Okay, so we've got a few of you teaching some, some, some uh, anybody I didn't mention? Somebody teach something? What do you teach? We can now teach technology. Excellent, there's a lot of interesting technology we can talk about also. Okay, good. So learning science by doing science. The thing about this is that they're never just sitting, right? can't really study the earth according to GLOBE unless you're outside in the environment studying it. So inherent to the program is field work. You don't ever just sit. Certainly we're going to do the introduction stuff and we're going to sit and we're going to talk about it and we're going to discuss it, et cetera, et cetera. But to actually learn it, you have to do it. To actually take data, you have to be out there doing it. And because it's a connection between and among student scientists and teachers, there are ways to get the students involved with the scientists. Okay. The investigation areas, atmosphere and climate, hydrology, land cover biology, phenology, and soils. Now, here's the thing for me. I like looking at it more as like connections among them. I don't ever just study atmosphere. 
I find it very hard to study rainfall, for example, without studying either what land cover that rain is falling on or what water body that rain is falling on. I don't want to study the land cover without knowing what kind of soil is supporting that land cover. So it's always going to be a systems approach and always about the connections among them. Now let's talk about phenology. What do you all think phenology is? Anybody know? Study of pheno. Study of pheno. And what is that? I don't know. OK. Fair enough. So phenology is the study of green up and green down. What's green up and green down? Trees. Trees. What are they doing? Oh, giving off carbon dioxide. Oxygen. So photosynthesis, CO2 fixation. Yes, but when we're talking about green up, we're talking about bud burst. At what time of year do the buds burst on the trees? Spring. Green up. In, in this area, sure. They green up at what time of the year? Spring. 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 Roughly when? April. April. OK. And green down, what time do the leaves start going from green to yellow, brown, et cetera? Fall. Fall. Now, if we were to study that, and we were to study that year after year, what are we studying? The cycle of the trees. What else? The life cycle. What else? Year after year, if we study what day do the buds burst? Climate. Climate, possibly climate change. You're studying the seasons. The seasons in your biome. Okay. So again, when we're studying phenology, we can't just, for example, study just bud burst. In fact, let me ask you the question. With seed germination, what's the limiting factor to seed germination? What do you all think? Moisture. Anybody have a different answer? Temperature. Temperature of what? Soil. Soil in the air. Yeah. Here's the thing, though, and this is something there's disagreement in the scientific community about. Atmosphere or soil. The air temperature can change pretty radically. It can go up and it could go back, right back down, and the buds might not burst. We might have a day or two of warm weather in the winter, and the buds won't burst. The seeds won't germinate. The soil moves more slowly but more consistently. When it gets to a certain level, that's when we'll start seeing seed germination. Depending on who you're talking to, an atmospheric scientist versus a soil scientist, you'll get different answers. There is some disagreement in the scientific community about it. The kids can take part in that discussion. Okay? So there's a lot of stuff that they can be doing as part of this. Questions? Oh, yeah, let me go back one. 55 plus, it's really 56, science protocols and 60 learning activities. Okay, so the protocols themselves let us have the science be really well done, and the learning activities supplement everything. And the learning activities, we're going to do one this afternoon, they're really, really good for helping promote developing the knowledge to do the science correctly. Okay, so if you're teaching bulk density, what you're teaching is, by volume, the density of your soil. Knowing the density of, of your soil lets you start getting a lot of information about what that soil can be used for. But notice after bulk density, we have pH. Now we've seen pH three times. We've seen it in atmosphere, we've seen it in hydrology, we've seen it in soil. You can do some nice analysis looking at the pH of a water body that's near, near the soil where you're also testing the pH of the rainfall. There's some nice analysis that can be done. And if you want to go even further, the pH of whatever is growing where you're doing your study, if there's land cover there, those plants like specific soil pHs. You can test that too. Questions? Land cover. Anybody here, do you do tech ed? Muck classification. OK, the modified UNESCO classification system is a way of classifying land cover, whether it's rural, urban, forested, woodlands, what is it? OK? What we can do with it is there's a um, computer-assisted clustering. There's an app called Multispec that does this for you, with you, and you work it that way. There's also another app that looks at water quality that's called Basic Gaps, that it's a modeling system. You model by putting in a whole bunch of data. You can model it and get a, a model of wa water quality if you have all that science done. Okay, Hydrology, advanced protocols of dissolved oxygen, alkalinity, and nitrates. These are kits. There's a lot of information in the teacher's guide. That DVD is your teacher's guide. It's a 1,200-page book. So there's an incredible amount of information in the teacher's guide that will supplement what you're doing. And the kits are available from like forestry suppliers, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're doing chemistry, there's a lot of really good stuff to be done here. Soil fertility is essentially NPK. 
for those of you who are chemistry, and it's a qualitative measurement rather than a quantitative measurement. The quantitative measurements for nitrate, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is actually quite expensive. So this is a qualitative, low, medium, or high. Particle size distribution is really nice. It's looking at specific gravity of things falling out of suspension. And you can tell the relative amounts of sand, silt, and clay in your soil based on that. Questions? Particle density is still under development. Computer assisted clustering, we've already talked about. Hydrology, these are optional salinity, titration, and the macro invertebrates, either marine or freshwater. Infiltration is great, but it takes about an hour and a half, so unless you have a block schedule, you, you just don't have time to do it. It takes too long. And then these two are sensors, which are still really under development. These special protocols, we've already talked about phenology, bud burst, lilacs is when they bloom, again, looking at seasonal change. Snowpack water equivalent, and then fire ecology, which is going to be really cool because it's going to be looking at ecosystems pre and post wildfires and how they're different. Fascinating stuff. So there was an international community of scientists that got together and they were asked, what do you want to know about the earth? And they came up with their wish list of all the measurements they'd love to have locally. Because the big thing about this is that when students are taking these measurements, often they're taking them in places where no scientist has done the science. And there's a lot of stuff that we can do remotely, but there's a whole heck of a lot we can't do unless we're right there in the environment where we're studying it. Questions? These are the interdisciplinary science that are system science oriented. Seasons and biomes we've already talked about, right? Looking at bud burst. What are the things might you want to measure? Might you want to measure air temperature? amount of water, soil temperature, there are all these things you'd want to measure. If you're looking at carbon cycle, we're talking about carbon biomass. There's a lot of stuff you can do there with dominant and co-dominant species of trees, how big the trees are, their, their circumference, their age, the types of trees. All of that is part of GLOBE, and you can do it as part of studying the carbon cycle. Watershed dynamics. Somebody tell me what a watershed is. OK. So it's a geographic region wherein anywhere in that geographic region, the water will eventually all go down to one central body of water, right? If that's the case, when you're studying watershed dynamics, you can study not only what the water bodies are like, but what's the soil like that that water's going through. Like, for example, any big seafood lovers here? Any seafood lovers? OK, if you like seafood, particularly clams and oysters, and you get them from the bay, Wow, then you become more interested in the quality of the water in the bay. Knowing what that water is going through before it gets into the bay, what watershed is involved. Because the Chesapeake Bay watershed is huge, right? It goes up into central New York, western PA, Virginia, West Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and DC all go into the bay. It's gigantic. It's one of the biggest watersheds on the planet. Because of that, all of that water eventually somehow over time winds up in the bay we start becoming much more interested in what's going on in the rest of the watershed. So you're not studying just the water bodies. You're studying the land and the land cover that that water's going through. You're studying the lay of the land. You're studying its topography. Make sense? Questions? OK, scientific research process. This should be very familiar to all of you since you're high school science teachers. This is what GLOBE wants the students to do. They want students to observe <coughs> nature, pose the questions, develop their hypotheses, plan the investigation, get the data and analyze it, document their conclusions, present their findings. The thing about presenting their findings is that what they want them to do is never just do the science. Just like regular scientists, they want them to present the science. And in fact, a week and a half, we have the Globe Annual Meeting where we're going to have students coming to present their papers. Fully 30% of the attendees of the annual meeting are going to be student scientists that are coming from all over the world. We have them coming from Oslo, Norway, from Helsinki, Finland, from as far away as Fairbanks, Alaska, and Johannesburg, South Africa, to present papers they've done using these protocols. So the more that we have them doing the science, the more they get to do. It's pretty neat stuff. This is some of the research and engagement pieces that students have been involved in. The video climate competition, the one at the bottom there, they, they just finished for the year, but I think they're planning on doing it again. This is events around the world. The, the September 2010 Kilimanjaro, Mount Kilimanjaro 
expedition was really cool. In fact, they're planning one, maybe another one, a global learning expedition to Costa Rica. And if you get involved, it's actually cool because it, as a GLOBE teacher, if you get involved, there, there are some funding agencies to which you can apply, like Donors Choose and GoFundMe and all that. That's what some of our teachers are doing to come to the annual meeting. You can get some funding, being a GLOBE teacher, to come do these things. It's pretty neat. And you bring your kids, of course. These are the sponsoring agencies. NASA, NOAA, and NSF are the three big science guys. The Department of State is involved because the Department of State actually is the department that signs the reciprocal agreements with other countries. It's an actual diplomatic agreement that these countries are going to be globe countries. The others are all involved, but the, the four big ones are NASA, NOAA, NSF, and State. And these are some of the achievements. The big one, I think, is the 500 plus known scholarly publications. I think that's really neat, because not all of these are by scientists. Some of these are by students. Questions? Okie doke. It's in there somewhere. Let's see if it's at the beginning. Yes, should be it. And then go ahead and start up the slideshow for me. All righty. Here we go. Tell me what you see. Nothing. Nothing. <laughs> that was fun. I'm glad it wasn't an embarrassing picture, right? What do you see? Earth. Clouds. Water. Land. Soil. Nice. Very nice. You're already angling for that poster. Where do you see desert? The light, light here, yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It's a, it's an assumption, but it's a good guess. Yeah. Why? <laughs> drier soil. Why, why are we saying it's a good guess? Because it looks like it's dry. Because it looks like it's dry. Okay. So yeah, we can observe it. But remember, this is a comp satellite composite image from the MODIS satellite system, 800 miles away, right? We're currently 800 miles away from the Earth, so we're seeing something that is 7,000 miles in diameter, roughly, about seven feet across. So we're seeing it from pretty far away, correct? Can we see detail? We can see some. We can see, can we see geopolitical boundaries? Yeah. Nah, if it's an island, you can't see Australia over there, but it's here. If you saw that, you go, okay, that's, we know that's Australia anyway. Here, can you see all the countries in the Arabian Peninsula? No, we don't know where they're delineated. We know they're there, but we don't know where they're delineated. Can you see the land cover on here? You said it was desert. Are we sure it's desert? Are we sure it's all desert? No, we're not really. Let's zoom in and see what it looks like. Here's a little bit closer, 120 miles away. Okay? Still desert, but is it all desert? No. We can see probably this is desert. What's this? Less desert. I like that. Maybe not quite so much desert. Maybe more moisture. Yeah, the thing is, and this is the point that I'm trying to make here, is that we're still really far away, and we'd like to go, yeah, we see more details. We know more about what's there, but we don't know full detail. And for soil scientists, in order to study the soil, you have to be right there with it. Right now, there is no way to study soil remotely. Not really. Okay. In 2014, they're going to be putting up a satellite, NASA is going to be putting up a satellite called SMAP, Soil Moisture Active Passive, which is going to be able to bounce microwaves and radar down to the surface of the Earth and get us soil moisture by volume, three by three kilometer squares. Every three days, they will be able to get the entire soil moisture of the entire planet. But they are still three by three kilometer squares. So on the one hand, oh my stars, that's amazing. And on the other hand, it's three by three kilometers. Now here's the thing. How cool would it be if students could do the soil moisture sampling right where that satellite's going over and could tell us whether or not that satellite's right? Here's the thing. There's an agreement being made between SMAP and the GLOBE program for students to do just that. So they're going to be doing science no one has ever done in a way that's incredibly helpful. Protocol's already there. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. You'd be able to access it and do it. Thing is, right now, you will not be being trained in the soil moisture protocols. 
You'll be trained in the field characterization, sort of the basic of the basic, because we, this is, when I say to you we're doing the first six weeks of a soil science class, college level, I am not kidding. There is a lot to go over. We just didn't have time to do soil moisture because it takes drying time, it takes a lot of, takes a lot of doing. But if you ever want to get trained that way, you can be, and then you can do and participate with the SMAP program. And you'll get to work with me some more because I sort of work with them on that. Okay, so yeah, much as we'd like to, this doesn't give us very much detail. And if we're gonna to wanna to study the soil, we need to have it up close and personal. But that begs the question, why study it? Why do we wanna study the soil? What does it do that we'd wanna study it? It's money for us, we need it to grow food. We need it to grow food. That's a big one, right? Oxygen. Oxygen. It's a carbon sink, sure. Let's start with food. Take a look at that. <laughs> Tell me any part of that, anything. Show me something that is not somehow related to soil. Anything. The plate? The plate? Metals in the soil, metals mined through the soil, either in the soil or through the soil to get to the bedrock, sure. The syrup comes from the trees. What butter else? Butter on the pancakes. Butter on the pancakes. All right, let's talk about butter. Where does the butter come from? Cows. cows. And what do cows eat? Grass. And where does grass grow? The soil. The soil. Everything. Yeah. I worked for my boss. My boss was the original principal investigating scientist for soils in the GLOBE program. She also it was, she retired now, a NASA soil scientist for 30 years. First day I came in to work for her, Elisa said, all right, I need you to come up with something that is not somehow related to soil, go. For 12 years I tried, and for 12 years I failed. She could always bring everything back to somehow being related to soil. So yeah, anything here that you cannot think, you know, somebody earlier said, what about the glass? Tell me how the glass is related to soil. What was that? Sand. Made it melted sand, okay? Part of the soil, make sense? All right, anybody here wear clothes today? Anybody wearing clothes? I love how y'all aren't all raising your hands. Bunch of naked people, right. So anybody wearing cotton? Okay, cotton, cotton plant, right? Rayon is made out of wood pulp, which is a plant product. What about polyester? What's polyester made out of? Anybody know? Isn't it a combination of? Silk and cotton? Nope. <laughs> Petroleum. Petroleum. It's a plastic, yeah. Polyester is a petroleum product. How is petroleum related to soil? It's sort of. You have to drill for it through soil. But no, there's an even more important way that petroleum is related, a more direct way petroleum is related to soil. Okay? Soil is a waste decomposer. Cajillions of years ago, soil decomposers decompose plants and animals on the forest floor. Those plants and animals were reduced to their natural and essential nutrients and oils. Those oils, through time, through pressure, et cetera, et cetera, that's the petroleum products, okay? That's one of the things the soil does, is to reduce plants and animals to their essential nutrients and oils. So without soil, we'd have no petroleum, certainly no polyester, no plastics, no gasoline, and no oil. Okay? You all have, to keep the soil momentum going, you all have some unusual objects on the desks in front of you. Some things that you might not expect to see lying on a classroom table. Lipstick, okay? How's that lipstick related to soil? The pigment in that lipstick is soil. What else? Unusual objects. Golf tees made out of wood, grows in the soil. What else? Makeup. Face powder, that's bare minerals. It's literally soil mineral powder. What else? The book made out of paper grows, yeah. Ceramic, which is made out of clay. What else? The brick. What's the brick made out of? It's made out of clay, which is part of the soil. What else? Neosporin, that's one of my favorites. How is neosporin related to soil? Anybody know? Petroleum. It is a petroleum product, but that's not why I put it up there. Anybody? There's no reason you would know unless you knew. Cocoa butter, cottonseed oil, sodium. Okay. 
That's part of it. Let me talk to you about the active ingredient in Neosporin. Okay? Soil scientists were studying a little critter that lives in the soil, a little microorganism called Streptomyces fraudiae waxman. That little micro, I know, little microorganism, huge name. That little microorganism would excrete a substance that would keep all the other little microorganisms away. And they went, ooh, we like that substance. That was the substance they used to make Neosporin out of. They synthesize it now, but originally it was that antibacterial that was excreted by the Friday Waxman. Which one that, is what was that? Which one is it? Which one is what? There's a there's an active ingredient yeah, listed on there. Bacitracin. Bacitracin. Neomycin. Neomycin. And polymyxin. The neat. The neomycin <laughs> is the is is the one that's the, 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 the is the Friday Waxman. Mm -hmm. Can you say the little bug? Yeah. Oh, I, I'll show it to you. But oh, it's, it's Streptomyces Friday Waxman. Streptomyces Friday Waxman. Waxman. Yes, I'll show it to you. You'll see it written down in a minute. <laughs> My husband does that too. He sort of just takes words and and makes words that he might no out of the words that he's just heard. Um, okay, so any other unusual objects? You're, there's one right in front of you, sir. Sure, but the kaopectate is what we're talking about here. Okay, the KAO in kaopectate is the same thing as the KAO in a clay called kaolinite. It's a very stable clay that its job is very good. It soaks up acids. So. The KAO in kaolinite is in kaopectate. When you have an acid stomach, you take a little kaopectate. The kaolinite will sort of soak up that acid. You eliminate it. No more acid stomach. Okay, actual clay. Any other unusual objects? Ma'am, you have one in a bag right in front of you. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody else was like, oh, I have a bag of cocaine here. I'm like, thanks a lot, right, because I would do that. No, that's just, it's high desert sand. High desert sand. <laughs> You're killing me, man. The, the street name is High Desert, great. They're never, Immaculata is never going to ask me to come back now, y'all. Thanks a lot. All right, yeah, it's high desert sand. Both clay and sand are considered part of the soil. They're the two outer ranges of particle sizes, sand being the biggest, clay being the smallest. The one in the middle is called silt. We'll talk more about them later. Any other unusual objects? I think we've gotten them all. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's, that's bentonite clay, another name for that. Kitty litter. Kitty litter. Unused, of course, but bentonite clay is the kind of clay that really likes to soak up fluids. So that's why bentonite, when you have 100% clay kitty litter, you've got bentonite. Okay, so acacia trees, yes. Ceramics, we've already talked about. Makeup, we've already talked about. Sand paintings, this is soil as art. Oh yeah, there's one other we little, where is the purse? Anybody see a little oh, purse? Right ah, ye <laughs> <laughs> All righty. <laughs> could, somebody hold the, could somebody hold the purse up for us? I'm like, I'm missing one. Okay, so take a look at this print. No, 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 keep holding it up. Keep holding it up. <coughs> take a look at the print. <laughs> Y'all are hilarious. Okay, so looking at the purse. Yeah, it's made out of cotton, so that's one of it. No, 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 seriously, hold it up. It's important. He just does not want to hold up the purse. Are you nervous holding up the purse? Is that... All right, here, you can give it to me. I'll hold it up. It's fine. All right, so the print on this purse. Okay, if you look at the print on this purse, it is made from a process called African mud cloth, or bogolanfini. Okay, say it with me, bogolanfini. Bogolanfini. Yeah, so bogolanfini is a process done on the west coast of Africa and only on the west coast of Africa, really on the Ivory Coast, process passed down from mother to daughter. What they do is they take soil, different colors of soil, and they put it on fabric into patterns. Then they take the leaf of a very specific tree, they would not tell me what tree it is because they want to keep that part of the secret of how to make the cloth. They make a poultice. They put it on the soil and then they press it down for a year. 
the tannic acid in the poultice bonds with the soil and bonds it onto the fabric and turns it into a dye. I've washed this in the washing machine. It's not going anywhere. Okay, African mud cloth. Now, much as I'm really happy about this, it's not that pleasing a pattern, right? So I'm going to show you one that's a little bit nicer. Okay, this is African mud cloth. Different colors of soil used as a dye. Okay, from Ivory Coast. Isn't that cool? It's pretty unusual. And as science teachers, you could get into some of the chemistry behind it. Yep, it has to sit so that the tannins can act on the soil and turn it into a dye. It's a year. If you go to soil.gsfc.nasa.gov, which is the soil science education homepage that I used to curate for NASA up until I left about two weeks ago, you can find more information that I was able to research and get. They really don't like to give a lot of details out, but I was able to get some. So if you want to find out more about the science behind it, you can do it there. So sand paintings. Come on. There we go. This is another one. This is a mandala from Tibet. All the colors, except for the green and the blue, are natural soil colors. Sand painting. Here's one from China. Same thing. OK? More Bogolan Fini examples. Bricks we've already talked about. This is interesting. The one on the left, the house on the left, the lady built the house with her own two hands. She took a framework of sticks and packed onto them a bunch of soil. Okay? These circles she did with a Coke bottle as a stencil. She packed a different color of soil inside the circles. The symbolism is to welcome friends and family into her home. The circles symbolize sort of a, a welcome to loved ones. What's interesting about this is that inside her home, her mattress is not a mattress. Her bed is made out of soil. Her chairs are made out of soil. Her table is made out of soil. She polished them to a fine sheen. And that's what she lives on and in. Okay? It's fascinating to me because they don't have, you know, lots of access to wood. They don't have lots of access to fabric. They have what they have. And this is how she lives. I was doing this training in a school in Maryland, and Maran Germa, who is a Globe teacher, you can find her if you go. She's a technology teacher at Dunlogan Middle School in uh, Ellicott City, Maryland. She's from Ethiopia. She's from Addis Ababa. So she's from the city, not the countryside. But she said that this kind of house, it, they still have them in the countryside. She's like, yeah, when I go home, I will see these in the rural areas, which is kind of neat. This is a different type of soilless construction. This is an earthship home. What they do is they take old car tires. They put soil on the inside. And you can see, see how this rounded area? These are car tires filled with soil. And they use them as the foundation of houses. Okay, the foundation itself then becomes a lot more insulated and sturdy. Soil is an insulator. It keeps things colder when they're warm, when it's warm outside, keeps things warmer when it's cold outside. I'm actually thinking we might be able to go outside. Look, it's sunny out. Huh, we might be able to do our field work outside. That'll be awesome. Okay, so anyway, because of that, you don't use as much AC or as much heating. The other thing is that it's so stable, they're finding that it is able to withstand severe weather events much better than traditionally built houses. So they're building them in Tornado Alley because they're able, better able to withstand severe weather events. Neosporin, here's that Streptomyces Friday Waxman. Keopectate, here we go. Okay. Things we've talked about so far. It's a medium of crop production, producer and absorber of gases. It's a big, huge carbon sink, for example. One of the things that they've noticed, who's done any reading about the melting of the permafrost in northern Siberia? Anybody read about that? One of the things that it's been releasing is pretty large amounts of CO2 and methane. It's been holding on to them for gajillions of years because that permafrost has been frozen. Now it's melting. So some of that gas, some of those gases are being released. It's a medium for plant growth. We've talked about it. Home to organisms, plants, animals, and others. Talk to me about who lives in the soil. What critters live in the soil? Worms. Worms. Worms are the soil's best friend. They're the aerators. Who else? Potato bugs. Potato bugs. The little ones that go bloop. Okay. Who else? Bacteria, fungi. Yes, fungi, bacteria, moles, voles. Slugs. Slugs. Anybody a Bugs Bunny fan? Rabbits. 
Rabbits, rabbits. wasque wabbits. wabbits, right? Okay. Who else? Who else lives in the soil? Hedgehogs, Hedgehogs groundhogs, prairie dogs, snakes, foxes. Lots of critters make the soil their home. What do they do when they're in there? They move around in it. They help the soil sort of do its thing because they create pore space, right? As they burrow, they create air space. Air space in soil, as far as it being arable, very important, okay? It's an essential natural resource. Here's the thing. The reason I say here that it's an essential natural resource is because I think it really is. Soil actually forms rather slowly. It does not form on the human time scale. It forms on a geologic time scale. Now let me ask you the question. In a temperate climate, and the reason I say temperate, I don't, I'm not saying like in the tropical or in a really cold climate. It's because in soil, like in everything else, warmer and moisture, more warm and more moist, I guess. The more warm and the more moist things happen, the faster things happen. The more cold and dry, the slower things happen. So in a temperate climate, not too much rainfall, not too much heat, not too much cold, not too much dry, how long do you think it takes to form an inch of soil from bedrock? <coughs> what do you think? A thousand years. Less than a thousand. Five hundred. Five hundred. About five hundred years on average. Now the question then becomes, how long does it take to erode an inch of soil? Could be a day, could be 30 seconds in a good windstorm, yeah. right? If the soil is loose, if there's nothing holding on to it, if it doesn't have good hardy ground cover on it, whatever, you can erode an inch of soil like that. So if it forms that slowly and it can erode that quickly, we start thinking about how many billions of people did we have to have it feed, right? We have to feed more than 7 billion people. Oh, and by the way, anybody know what percentage of the surface of the earth is arable soil? Small, Small amount, only about 8 to 10 percent of the entire planet's surface is arable soil. So not very much, right? We're talking eight to 10% of the surface to feed seven billion people and also do all the other things that we're counting on soil to do. Bricks and kaopectate and everything else. Okay, so it's, we're, talking, we're talking essential natural resource, right? It's also a filter of water and waste. It's a giant Brita filter. Source material for construction, medicine, and art waste decomposer, we've talked about that with petroleum, and it provides a snapshot of geologic, climatic, biological, and human history of where that soil was formed. So it tells us what was going on, where that soil was formed. Make sense? Yes. Okay, here we go. This image was taken by one of my other mentors in soil, Dr. Ray Weil, who teaches at the University of Maryland, he actually wrote what most people consider the soil science Bible, the nature and properties of soil. He wrote the most recent version. He's a fantastic guy. He's always willing to answer questions. If you ever have soil questions and you can't get me, I would highly recommend you contact him. Soil story, here's the thing. This is a soil profile. Just like the profile of your face has characteristics, the vertical, soil of a, uh, vertical face of a soil also has characteristics, right? What we've got here is a pit, usually one by one by one meters. See these red and white things? They are about 10 centimeters each. This is the floor of the pit. The rest is a vertical, in this case, creek bed. Okay, so a creek bed in College Park, Maryland, in the Chesapeake Bay watershed. When they were studying the soil profile, they found in the middle of the soil profile right here, this layer of funky stuff that they didn't know what it was at first. Okay, it was de deposited into this creek over a period of 100 years, okay? About 150 to 250 years ago, roughly. Now let's do the history lesson. What would deposit a strange fine gray powder in the middle of this soil profile 150 to 250 years ago, over that 100 year period? Civil War. Civil War, okay, was the Civil War 100 years long? No. Okay, four years long for the Civil War, this was over a period of 100 years. What would cause that? In fact, let's ask the question before that. What do you think that fine gray powder is? Coal. Could be coal. What else? Ash. Ash. Okay, let's say it's ash. What would cause a 100 year deposit worth of ash? Industrial Revolution. Okay, when did the Industrial Revolution start? Early 1900s. 1880s, it was starting to begin 1890s. That's a little bit later. 150 to 250 years ago, what was happening? Think about the region. Think about the geography of the region. What was happening? What was going on historically 150 to 250 years ago? What was happening? Everybody's like, I took history a long time ago. What are you doing? Oh. Climbers? 
Farmers. What was that? Farmers. 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 Let's talk about the farmers. How did the farmers get there? Come on, Todd. Give them the hints, man. They, what was that? They were knocking, they were knocking the trees down. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Todd. Yeah. So, so that's the thing. Had to burn the trees. Had to burn the trees down at any point. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah. Anybody know the term slash and burn agriculture? Yeah. That's what they were doing. The, what was on the land before the farms? Forests. This whole area was forested, right? They were cutting all the forest down and burning the trees to make room for farms. This ash is from that era. It was deposited over that 100-year period in this. Now, it's not, that's not all the ash, obviously, but there's evidence of this ash being there. Nice history lesson, right? In the middle of the soil profile. Here's another one. The layer below, the horizon. By the way, the layers of the soil are called horizons. The horizon below, see these little nodules? They are clam and oyster shells, okay? They were deposited approximately 250 to 350 years ago. What they are is Native Americans would come to the Chesapeake Bay and they would have their holiday feasts. They would party down, they would eat a lot of shellfish, and that's their party leftovers. Literally, they would leave the detritus, and some of that got deposited right in this soil profile. Okay? It's going to take a little while before it's part of the arable soil, but it's a deposit that's sitting there and got deposited to tell us the history of the place. The way a soil is formed is impacted by what went on near that soil as it was being formed. Does that make sense? Okay. Soil forming factors. Having talked about that a little bit, let's talk about this. This is another kind of soil profile. This is a very specific kind called a spodosol. Spodosols are always under conifers, always under coniferous forest trees, usually with sandy soil. Lots of acid, and the nutrients are no longer here. This is all pretty much dead soil. It's kind of white, not a lot of nutrients. They leach down below. Just a quick question. Yeah. Last line. You say, how long do you say it took for an inch of soil? Before? From bedrock to arable soil, approximately 500 years in a temperate climate. Mm -hmm. I was just curious, like, that soil, that layer of soil was from like 200 years ago. How can it be that much soil? On top Remember, of it was deposited as a creek bed. So this is. Let's, let's look at it this way. See this A? The A is the A horizon, which is topsoil. Then we go into not really terribly well-developed soil yet. All these Cs are not well-developed soil, so they're, they're on their way to There's developing. Soil, that's, that's still not considered. That's not considered part of the soil properties there yet. It's still in process. So what's the word you put before soil? Air, arable? Arable, what's that arable is farmable, workable, okay. arable. Mm -hmm. Good question. But could you, you could farm on top of that? Sure, you could. I mean, those grasses, if you notice, where their roots stop? Right there. Right there, right below that A horizon, not a lot of roots. Okay, it, they're not permeating in part because the stuff isn't all ready to, to support them. Questions? Okay, so. I am not sure what it would be right along this creek bed. Okay. I don't know. I would have to, that's the thing about soil. It's hard to speculate unless you're right there with it. Are there trees back there? You yeah. can see graminoids. I'm not sure if any of those are trees. It could be tall bushes. I was not there when the picture was taken. So I don't know. And I really hesitate to speculate because I just, without being there, I have no idea. I would imagine probably there's a fair number of trees in College Park. I just don't know what this is, because this is a creek bed, remember. This is a dead creek. So there's mostly grasses growing around it, not too many trees, probably, but I don't know what's there or what was there. That's why you have to be there with the soil to study it. <laughs> okay, soil forming factors. Here we go. Parent material is the actual stuff the soil is made out of. What is it? What are the minerals? What are the organics? What makes the soil? Climate, tell me the difference between weather and climate. Anyone? Yeah, weather's day to day. So if it rains today but not tomorrow, that's not really going to impact the formation of our soil. It might erode some soil, but it won't impact the formation. What we want to know is what's the climate like over the long haul. Topography. What's topography? Mm -hmm. Lay of the land, right? Remember how things happen faster if it's moist and sunny, and they happen slower if it's cold and dry. So if I'm a soil profile on a hill, 
and the sun is over here. Will the soil on this side of the hill be the same as the soil on this side of the hill? No, why not? Yeah, it'll be more highly oxidized, more highly weathered on the side that's warmer. Make sense? There's all sorts of science you can do around that, depending on the, on the topography. So when we're studying soil, one of the things we're interested in knowing is the lay of that land. Make sense? Okay. Same thing happens if I'm the soil at the top of the hill versus the soil at the bottom of the hill. It'll be different, right? Why? Why would soil be different from the top of a hill to the bottom of the hill, even if it's just a couple of meters? Huh? More sedimentation. One of it would, not only more sedimentation, but water flows downhill, right? You'd expect there to be more moisture down at the bottom. So where you are makes a big difference. Question for y'all. Do you want to put a landfill at the top of a hill or the bottom of a hill? Bottom. Why? Decompose quicker, maybe. Do you want it on a sandy soil or a high clay content soil? Clay. clay. Why? It's, um, less permeable. Less permeable. Okay. The less permeable, the longer it will take things to filter through, the more soil, which is a gigantic Brita filter, can purify whatever goes through it. So you want a less permeable soil on which you build a landfill. What about a septic system? More permeable. What about a house, top of the hill or bottom of a hill? Floodplain or not a floodplain? Yeah. High clay content soil that expands when it gets wet and contracts when it gets dry? Or a very stable clay that does not do that? So, exactly. <laughs> this, is when, this is when we can really start thinking about what is it that we're trying to do on top of that soil or in that soil, and what do we need to know about it before we do it? Is it going to be well suited? Lots of science research that can be done just based on that. Here's a scary fact for y'all. Only five universities in the nation require an introduction to soil science class from their landscape architecture, civil engineering, and urban planning majors. That terrifies me. I'm like, really? In fact, one of the other teachers in one of the other sessions said, oh, I can tell you about that. Some, one of her neighbors, a few, she, they live on a hill. One of her neighbors, a few houses up, had a pool put in, and the person obviously didn't know their soils. So they used to be fine, and now everybody downhill is constantly flooded. Constantly, they're getting flooding. The engineer had no soil training at all. And because of that, now there's flooding when there didn't used to be at all. All righty, so the last soil forming factor, which is over here. What was it? Time, absolutely. Now, let's talk about time. What do you see here? What do you see? By the way, ignore the gray bands. They're just satellite data that's missing. Cloud cover. Cloud cover. What else? Dust particles. Mm -hmm. Where are we? Atlantic Ocean. Atlantic Ocean, South Atlantic. OK. What's over there? What's over here? OK. What's this? What is it? Can you read that? Dust. Dust. Where's it going? From? So it's going from Africa to South America, right? This has been happening for a long time, our fifth soil forming factor. What is sun glint? Sun glint? Sun, sun glint? Sun, sun, sun glint. glint. Sun, sun glint. It's a, it's, it's a technical term that says that the sun is glinting off the, no, it's, sun glint. It's, it's, it's not sun glint, it's sun glint. It's a special kind of lint. It's a special kind of lint. All of the lint that's come out of every dryer ever is floating in the atmosphere. I'm just saying. Wouldn't that be air glint, air current glint or something? OK, so I did not create this image. Or I would probably have spelled some glint correctly. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, and this is part of it. Now, what's interesting about this, okay, what's coming over is a whole bunch of what they call LUS or silt particles. Say again. LUS, L O E S S, LUS. Okay, LUS or silt particles. Here's what is important about this over time thing that's happening, okay? <coughs> South America. What part of South America are we talking? What do you think? What part of South America is this? Brazil. Brazil. 
Now we're going to get to why I really want Brazil to be a globe country. What's here? Amazon. Amazon. Lots of plants, lots of animals. What do you say? Yes. Biggest and most diverse amount of flora and fauna on the planet in any one place, right? Largest. They don't want anybody to tell them what to do, and they don't want anybody knowing their data. Trust me, I know. But here's the thing. Here's what's important about this. This is Brazil. This is the Amazon rainforest. I'm going to let you in on a little secret. The soil supporting that most diverse and most amazing amount of flora and fauna on the planet, pardon my French, they suck. They're terrible soils. They're highly weathered, highly oxidized, just really yucky soils. And they're nutrient poor. Remember that whole moist and wet and, dry and hot thing? The more hot, the more moist, the more wet, the faster things happen. Those soils go through their nutrients like crazy. Where are they getting their nutrients? That dust cloud. The dust particles that are coming over and with the sun glint, all of this is helping provide nutrients for this amazing amount of flora. Okay, That's been happening for a long time. That, hence the whole less soil forming factor. If our wind current, our planetary wind currents change and this stops happening, we might not get these nutrients to the Amazon rainforest anymore. Okay, when you're working, when I'm working with younger kids, I ask them the question, what do animals breathe in? What do animals breathe in? Oxygen. What do they breathe out? What do plants breathe in? What do plants breathe out? Right, so that's a beautifully symbiotic relationship. 20 to 25%, somewhere around 22% of the world's photosynthesis and CO2 fixation takes place in the Amazon rainforest. Those plants are being supported by lust that's coming over from Africa to South America. If that were to stop for whatever reason, <clears throat> there could be trouble. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's why I really want Brazil to be a globe country. I would love to have some kind of data set looking at what their land cover is like, looking at what their quality, water quality is like, and especially looking at what their soil quality is like. I would love to have that. They're a sovereign state. They don't want anybody to know their stuff. So we don't. You know, Can't do anything about it. They do not want to have that agreement that people get to see what their stuff is like. <laughs> it makes me very sad. But yeah, that's the thing. It's important because these are global issues and the students themselves can study them. Questions? Okay. So the last one is time. The layers are called horizons. They, that will become more important later on. When we're out in the field, and we might just be able to go actually outside, is it pretty out? But it's looking sunnier. Is it raining? It's because the sun is when it's gone. But it's <laughs> <laughs> if, it's, if it's not raining when it's time for us to go outside, I would like to go outside because I think it's a richer experience. But if, it, if it's still raining, then we'll stay in. OK, so when you're out there, you're going to find out certain pieces of information. First and foremost, you're going to want to have a latitude and longitude. Why? Because you need to know if you're outside that you're doing science where you did the science. Todd's going to be talking to you about your GPS stuff. Did you all read the GPS PDF? Did some of you read the GPS PDF, I hope? OK. We're not going to train you on it. It's required for GLOBE, but I, I figured any GLOBE training you get, you'll need to read it. And frankly, we need every minute for the six weeks worth of soil science we're about to do. Elevation, slope, part of that topography, and aspect. Aspect is uphill. What's the greatest direction of your slope? Like if your slope is 10 degrees slope, what direction is it going in? That starts helping you understand where you want to put things, how you want to manage it. The method is pit, auger, or near surface. Pit is basically when, and that's, this is the most, um, the most desirable, I would say, because soil scientists want to look at soil in its natural state. As Soon as you move it, in any way you've disturbed it and you are not going to get as good data as you would if you'd left it right where it was. So ideally, you want to dig a pit. You want to dig a one by one by one meter pit and get in there, do your characterization, characterize that soil, get your lab samples, blah, blah, blah. That's really hard to do in most schools, right? So if you can, you can also do an auger profile that's getting a core, and we're going to be looking at one in a little bit. If you can't do that, then by gum, I say you take a trowel, and everybody has trowels in their buckets. You take a trowel. You get the top 10 centimeters, and that's what you characterize. 
So you do what you can. We gave you lots of options. Questions? The on school grounds, off school grounds, these are all things you fill in. That one, site location, you don't need to worry about because we're not doing any other site. We're only doing the one. Then the land cover type. Remember how I said what's on the soil is just as important as what's in the soil? It really is. They need to know what's on there, how it's being utilized. The parent material. The parent material is the actual stuff the soil is made out of. If you want to know what the actual stuff the soil is made out of in your school, you grab a soil survey. Each one for every county in all of the 50 states has been digitized. You can find the PDF. This one happens to be for Chester and Delaware. I found it for this county where we're in right now. If you want to find out yours, the US Department has them. The Department of Agriculture has the soil surveys. Google soil survey, the name of your county, Pennsylvania, you'll get the PDF. Here's what it looks like. It's a lot of data. This is just one page. And this was done, this was published back in 1963. So it's been a while. Okay, but they did go through step by step and they tried to characterize the soil, which is cool, but it's been a while. So when I say your students would be doing science no one has done for either a long time or ever before, I am not kidding. This is science nobody in the world has. So if they do it, they're doing science no one has ever done before. If we go to parent material in this area, it could be weathered rocks. How would they be weathered? Probably glacial till. Anybody know when the last glacier receded from these parts? When the last glacier received from Pennsylvania? Anybody know? About 12,000 years ago. Okay? It could be transported by water or it could be coastal plain. Coastal plain would be over many, many kajillions of years. The water brought stuff up on the shore and the sediments were brought over and that's how the soils developed underneath. Okay? So you can find that out by looking at your soil survey. So let's say it was bedrock. That's what we decided our parent material was. You just exit out and that's how you'd go on. Then land use is, is it urban, agricultural, recreation? What is it being used for? Distance from major features you don't need to worry about. Taking a look at this. Soils in different environments. These two soils underneath this land cover versus land cover, this land cover. Do you think they would be the same? Do you think those soils would be the same? They look like a, they're supporting pretty diverse, different kinds of stuff on top of them, right? Now, on the one hand, we'd have to be there to find out for sure. But on the other hand, we can start hypothesizing, probably not, not too similar. What about this wheat field versus the strawberry farm? Same, same, or different? Well, wheat is a resource hog, so it soaks up a lot of water, so you'd have to water it more often. Uh, the wheat? Mm hmm. I it's lived a out west where they, we had 12 inches of rain a year, so I know it's going to dry up. Yeah, yeah. So it, and it wants a lot of irrigation. No, they never, it was all dry land farming, they never irrigated it. They never irrigated the wheat? Where? No, it's winter wheat. Oh, okay, that's why. Out west. Okay, winter wheat. Yeah, then it's not all that hot. It can, it can survive. Remember cold, dry, warm, moist? Uh, it's like 114, in the summer, but in, when you're growing the winter wheat, it's going to be a different set of circumstances. Yeah. All right, what about the stag versus the sow and her baby? That's snow. No, that's just wet, sort of wet soil. What kind of soil do you think? Do you think the stag versus the sow and her baby have similar or different soils under them? Different, probably somewhat different. You do not want to fall down that big lot. <laughs> <laughs> That's sage advice. Okay, so when you're doing your characterization, you've got a hole to dig, describe the soil that you see, sample it if you're going to do lab work, and you, they ask you to do it at least twice near the soil moisture study site and within the biology study site. We're not going to be doing that here because we don't have any other sites we're working on. If you decide you want to do others, you can. But remember, the only thing you're going to be able to enter data on 
our stuff is stuff that you've already been trained on. If you want to get trained in more stuff, excellent. Look for a training in your area and go to it. But you can only enter data on stuff you've been trained on. You can do more. Do all you want piecemeal out of the 56 protocols. You just can't report them. The ones you'll be able to report are the field characterization ones. Make sense? OK. And you do everything in triplicate. If you've got 30, 35 kids in your class, or however many you have, you're going to be doing things in, you know, sex tuplicate, I guess. Because you'll, you'll, you'll have them work in groups. And that's what we're going to model when you guys are doing your field work. Wrong one. I have two of these to work, so I'm like trying to figure it out. So yeah, you dig a pit, that top left one, and you'd get in there and you'd characterize your soil, or an exposed road cut if you can. This is an auger, you'd auger the profile down, or surface sample, which is what we're gonna be doing. By the way, this presentation is gonna be made available to you. We'll make sure you can get it if you want it, so you don't have to take pictures if you don't want to, it's fine. I totally understand. It's just that you'll have it, you know, no problem. Okay. So looking at this soil profile from an arid climate soil in New Mexico, excuse me, you can see that there are different horizons, correct? Okay, I'm going to run my little laser down from the top to the bottom, and I want you to say now when you think one horizon stops and the next one starts. Ready? And? Now. 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 Okay, what were your criteria? Color. Color. Who said texture? Me. Okay. How can you tell the texture? <laughs> or do you mean maybe the shapes, the structure of it? Yeah, maybe the shapes. Yeah. The texture, texture, specifically soil texture, you have to do by feel. It's very hard to tell what exactly the texture would be by just looking at it. Chances are this, this is probably kind of sandy up here, but we don't know that until we're there and we do the texture classification, which we will learn how to do. So yeah, color tends to be one of the ways we can characterize the soil profile. There are others. When you're doing it, though, I want you to remember that soil scientists like to look at soil in its natural state. So if you have, by the way, these pictures my husband drew, aren't they cute? <laughs> so when you're doing this, expose a fresh soil face. Anytime, within a few hours, it starts changing a little bit because the sun has been hitting it. It's going to be a little drier. It's going to be, so you want it to be as, as fresh a soil face as possible, expose the soil face and then characterize that. What we're going to be doing is taking the top 10 centimeters, and that top 10 centimeters, that first shovel full, if you will, is what you're going to characterize. And we're going to be doing it using the look, look, press, squeeze method of soil science. 115. We have until 245, correct? Yeah, 15 more minutes. Okay. So we look at structure. We look at color. We press for consistency, and we squeeze for texture. Structure. We do by looking at a ped. A unit of soil is called a ped. Just like the root of the word pedestrian, is, it means ground, a ped is a unit of soil. So we're going to look at a soil ped to see what all those characteristics are. For structure, the first one is granular. Imagine the bottom of a bag of Oreo cookies, about half a centimeter in diameter. They're crumbly. They look kind of like cookie crumbs. And there's lots of little nooks and crannies. Okay? Blocky looks like this. Blocks. Think bigger hunks of Toblerone chocolate. Okay, I'm kind of food oriented right now. I'm still a little hungry. About one and a half to five cm in diameter. Prismatic, usually high clay content soils that are going to expand when they get wet and contract when they get dry, usually found out west. And you'll notice that same soil profile we just looked at. See these vertical striations? That's that prismatic structure. We didn't know to look for it before. But we can look at it now and go, yeah, this is probably more granular. This is prismatic. Make sense? OK. Columnar is very similar, except for it's in high salt content areas. And they kind of look like they're wearing little hats. They're like this, but they've got little hats on. Platy is urban soils. So if you've got a, a soil that's been compacted, the play, the, they're actually the peds sitting are one on top of the other. What they do, interestingly, is they actually then make it harder for plant roots to go through because they're one on top of the other. The water has to go around. The plant roots have to go around. They can't permeate as quickly into them. Make sense? OK. This is an example. 
right here under this grass, lots of people walk on it, it is probably platy structure. DuPont Circle in DC. Single grain is like sand at the beach. Okay, you can't even hold a ped. It's just falls apart. Massive, right here, is big, huge, sort of gigantic peds of soil. I've seen them be as big as a meter around. Now, ideally, the structure of a soil by volume would be 45% minerals, 5% organics, and then 25 each of air and water. Now, bulk density becomes very interesting because you're, when you're looking at the bulk density of the soil, you want it to be roughly one gram per cubic centimeter. That's what you want the bulk density to be in a good arable soil. Now, one gram per mil with water is water, right? That's the, that's the density of water. So what's going on? How could we have minerals and air and water going up to one gram per cubic centimeter or one gram per milliliter? How could we do that? What would you need? You need air. You need air space. So can't be just minerals and organics. The critters, the plant roots, the water, they all have to go somewhere. You need air space. That's how you can have one gram per cubic centimeter of bulk density in the soil per volume. Does that make sense? OK. Color. When we're looking at soil color, we're talking about the Munsell color wheel. The Munsell color wheel looks like this. Starts at red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, all the way back up to red. What we're doing when we're looking at soil color is we're looking at the hue, the value, and the chroma. You all should have color books in front of you or in the buckets in front of you. Please grab them. And turn to page six. Yeah, you might have to share. Okay, so the 7.5R in the color book on page 6 is the hue. It's the general shade of the color. And what it means is, too many things to turn here, it show, falls on, if you imagine this is a 360 degree circle, 7.5R would fall on the 7.5 degree slot of the Munsell color wheel. Make sense? It's the general hue, the general shade of the color. So when you see R, you see red. When you see YR, it's not year, it's yellow red. Most people think, oh, year. No, it's not. It's yellow red or yellow or green or whatever. If you go up the numbers of the, and down the numbers, the general hue on the page stays the same. It's all 7.5R. The number in front of the slash that's next to them goes up and down on that page. That's the value. The lighter the color, the higher the value. You'll notice it goes up to 8. And the lower the value, the darker the color. It goes down to 2.5. Make sense? It's a way of categorizing colors. This way, anybody who looks at a soil color book would be able to go, I know exactly what color they're talking about. Now, looking at the second slot, the 7.5R, 7 slash 2, the two represents a relatively low chroma. The chroma is how intense the color is versus how much gray there is in the color. Okay, so if we're looking at this, it's the bottom one. How much gray versus how intense the color. Same general hue and same general value across the pages onto page seven, but that 7.5R7 slash two on the second slot becomes 7.5R7 slash four. Then the next page is 7.5R7 slash six, and the last page, which is true color, 7 slash 8. Make sense? So that's how they categorize the colors. This is a truncated version of the Munsell color guide, soil color guide. This is about 300 colors. The Munsell color guide has actually over 500 colors. Now, turn to page 5. What would give you soils this color? What was that? A lot of biomass. Okay, what else? What else could give it to you? Wetlands. Wetlands. What, what kind of soil in the wetlands would give you that? You've seen this kind of soil in the wetlands? Yes. Mm -hmm. What kind of soil would give this to you? I mean, what kind of stuff in the soil would give you colors of soil this color? What? Algae, Algae possibly. What else? Lichen. What? Lichen, Lichen possibly. 
What? Okay, possibly. Sunglind? <laughs> Dryerland? Okay, so what I ask students about this is what's, what color is the Statue of Liberty? Yeah, it's green, it's made of copper. Oxidized copper is going to be this color. So waterlogged soils, highly oxidized soils that are waterlogged in swamps and marshes that have copper in them are going to be this green color. Turn to page 9. This color, these colors of soil, what would give you soils this color? What was that? Rusty? <laughs> yeah, iron. Iron oxide would give you soils this color. If you turn to page 40, that would be calcium. Whatever's in the soil gives it its color. By the way, those of you who were saying uh, lots of carbon biomass, they tend to make soils darker. So dark, rich, organic. High organics are going to make soils nice and dark. All right. So what you do to test the soil color is you take a pet of soil. You stand outside with the sun at your back. I'm really hoping we get to go outside. That would be so cool. You stand with the sun at your back so that it's shining on it, not in the shade. With the sun at your back, you take a ped. You moisten the ped. You let the water soak in. You break the ped until you are looking at something that has not seen the sun in a very, very long time. And then you match the color in your data okay? sheet. Not two guesses of the same color. You'll see it says primary color, second color. It's not two guesses of the same color. It's when you have two distinctly different colors. The king of soils. Oh. The mollusol. The mollusol, if you'll notice, has that beautiful dark organic color, lots of organics. Notice how it's pretty uniform in what it looks like except for the color because the granular structure is throughout. Lots of little nooks and crannies in this profile. They're the ones that are the big Iowa soils. Iowa corn country has those kinds of mollusols. They used to be as much as 90 meters deep. Now they're like three or four meters deep. They lost a lot of soil to erosion, runoff. The last thing that we're going to look at is consistence. Consistence is when we have not just the shapes it breaks into, but how easily it breaks. Loose consistence is like sand at the beach, like single grain structure. You cannot have one without the other. If you say something is single grain structure, it cannot have a consistence of firm or friable. Those are related to one another. If you take a ped in your hand and you press it and it pops open, that's friable. If you take it and it kind of dents your fingers, that's firm. And if you need a hammer to break it, it's extremely firm. Make sense? Here's what we're going to do. For the last six minutes, I want you to grab your golf tee that is in front of you. I want you to grab your soil color book and your field characterization guide, which is this, and come on down here. Oh, the sun is out. We are totally going. Gather round, ye people, gather round. I like that, nice. You want some chocolate, do you? When I do a longer training, I actually end up giving away lots of gifties to people, usually in the form of chocolate. This is too short, and I was not able to get enough for 253 of you. Gather around before the rest of the folks come in. When you are doing this, okay, I want you to imagine this is a core sample. It is a core sample, but this is what it would look like if you had, get, had gotten an augered profile. Or we could imagine we stood it up on its end, and we were sitting in a, in a soil pit looking at a vertical face of the soil. Always. The top of the soil profile, the top of the top horizon is always going to be zero. Okay, that's where we're going. And you place the meter stick that way so that zero is at the surface and then everything else goes down deeper. What you do, and this is what your students would do, is you take your golf tees. Everybody bring a golf tee? Mm -hmm. Take your golf tees. And now looking at this, these horizons, put your golf tee down where you think one horizon stops and the next one starts. However, however you're going to do it. This is what the students would do. And you may, have, you may find you have some disagreements, too. Some people might go, that's not a horizon. Or some people go, well, I think there's a horizon there. And some people will go, no. This one happens to be pretty clear, but they're not always clear.
<laughs> okay, anyone disagree with the choices? Now, if the top of our top horizon is zero and the top of the top horizon, the top of the first horizon is always zero, what is the bottom of our first horizon going to be? 14. 14. Anybody disagree? Can't see. Can't see? <laughs> okay, if the bottom of our first horizon is 14, what's the top of our second horizon? 14. 14. And what's the bottom of our second horizon? 27. And what's the top of our third horizon? 27. And so on. Make sense? Okay, so then when you characterize this, sun glint, I'm just going to start saying, anytime I need to cuss, I'm going to be like, sun glint. Okay, so now here's what we would do taking our field characterization guides, we would actually characterize structure, color, and consistence, all of these horizons. Now, I'm not going to ask you to do all of them. This is what you do in the school with your students. But we're going to take this horizon and we're going to characterize it. So looking at this horizon, remember, look, look, press, squeeze, right? Look at structure, look at color, press for consistence, and squeeze for texture. Let us do this horizon. Tell me what you believe, looking at it, the structure of that horizon is. What do y'all think? Mm -hmm. Now, please remember, this one might be blocky. Yeah, and, and remember, you do that for each of them. So when you do this horizon, you'd probably go, yes, this is blocky. Right now, we're just studying this one. Here's the thing. Please remember, we disturbed this soil, right? We took the soil from one place and moved it to another. That's why the pit is the ideal way of doing characterization, so that you don't disturb the soil. It's a lot harder to tell what it could have been before, what it was naturally. So what I would probably say in this situation is I would say granular, but it looks disturbed. Because again, make liberal use of your metadata. It looks granular for the most part to me, but it's been disturbed. So I would probably go, it probably naturally is blocky, but what I am seeing is lots of little potential cookie crumbs. When we start getting into these, we start seeing more blocks. Make sense? Okay, now go ahead and grab a pet of soil and use your color book and determine soil color. A pet is a unit of soil, whatever it is. Whatever the unit of soil is, that's what you're grabbing. Now remember, in the real world, what you will do, ladies and gentlemen, what you will do is you will take your pet, you will moisten your pet, because soil scientists look at, at soil when it's moist and sunny. You will moisten it. I think that one has water in it. I'm not sure these two, these do. You all have water in your buckets, which you'd be using outside. You would moisten your pad, you would let it soak in, you would break it open so that you're looking at a part of the soil that has not seen the sun for a very long time, and then you would match the color. Oh yeah, share book. Oh, please, yeah, yeah, don't, don't get the cloud chart all mucky. <laughs>